Good afternoon or good morning if you're joining us from another coast. Uh, thank you so much for joining our Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer webinar. Today's webinar is on precision medicine with Dr. Craig Lockhart. I am Britt Aaron. I'm the Programs Director for Debbie's Dream Foundation, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We would love to thank our sponsors for making this year or this webinar series possible for this year. This is our seventh webinar of the year. Um, so we would love to thank Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Merck, Taiho Oncology, and Estellas for really making this possible and all of these series possible this year. Um, so just a brief overview of the agenda. Um, first, we're going to share some information about stomach cancer and about Debbie Stream Foundation carrying stomach cancer. And then we're going to hear a presentation on precision medicine with Dr. Lockhart from the University of Miami. So the presentation will then be followed by a question and answer session. So you can type your questions into the question section that appears in the webinar menu. And then we'll address those questions at the conclusion of the presentation if the time allows, of course. And also the recording of this webinar will be accessible on our website in the lecture library, and we'll go over that in a little bit as well. So just a few uh, facts on stomach cancer. In 2018, it was estimated that more than 26,000 Americans would be diagnosed with stomach cancer and that about 11,000 would pass from this disease. Most patients are diagnosed at stage four when the five-year survival rate is only 5% and the incidence rates in younger populations are increasing. Uh, so many of them know uh, very little about this disease and uh, little research is being done. And, you know, we're here to help educate uh, the community and help fund research uh, so that there's more out there. Uh, so pictured here is the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Uh, Debbie was diagnosed with stage 4 stomach cancer in April of 2008. She had no risk factors at all for stomach cancer, and her symptoms were extremely vague. At the time, she was told that her chance of living was five, uh, for five years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many recurrences over nine and a half years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23rd, 2017, it's almost been two years, at the age of 50. She dedicated herself to helping others with stomach cancer uh, by raising awareness and providing resources and education. She founded DDF in April of 2009, and as an organization, we are a member of several advocacy coalitions, including the Deadliest Cancer Coalition, the Patient Equal Access Coalition, the State Patient Equal Access Coalition, and One Voice Against Cancer. Debbie served for many years as a patient advocate on numerous committees and task forces, and as an organization, DDF continues her important work and her legacy. Debbie's Dream Foundation is dedicated to advancing funding for stomach cancer research, raising awareness about stomach cancer, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can more, learn more by visiting our website at www.debbiesdream.org. In a few short years, uh, Debbie's Dream has achieved many great milestones. We have 29 chapters across the U.S., as well as chapters in Canada and Germany, and we have events that are ongoing around the country. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. Our patient, uh, patient resource and education program helps patients, their families, and caregivers around the world by matching them with survivors and caregivers using disease-specific criteria, including age, biomarkers, location. Uh, we host educational webinars such as these and symposia year-round, and our website contains a ton of information about stomach cancer that can be translated into more than 60 languages. We have also now provided $1 million in research grants to date, and we advocate each year during our Stomach Cancer Capitol Hill Advocacy Day to add stomach cancer to the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. We will be returning to Washington, D.C. next February to maintain funding for researchers. Uh, we'll be there on the 10th and 11th, and if you're interested, you can visit our uh, website and our event section to find out more. So our efforts over the last seven years have resulted in $18 million being awarded to stomach cancer researcher, researchers. So please consider joining us in uh, February 2020 in Washington. And like I said, more information can be found on our, we in our website under the heading Take Action. This is a current snapshot of our website's homepage with links to numerous resources. So we invite you to check it out. 
And then you can see on the horizon, we have many events for 2020 coming up. We have our 11th annual Night of Laughter in Florida on January 26th. As we discussed, we have our 8th annual Capitol Hill Advocacy Day. We have our second Miami Night of Laughter on March 8th. Uh, we have another webinar uh, topic is to be determined coming up on March 6th. We have our 11th annual Dream Makers Gala in Hollywood. And then we have a gastroesophageal symposium coming up uh, at Ohio State uh, mid-May. We'll have many more events posted on our website, and you can see that the link is listed below. Here is the contact information. Uh, we're headquartered, headquartered in uh, Sunny Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on the slide are the important phone numbers and email addresses. You can also find those on our website as well. So we'd love to introduce you to Dr. Craig Lockhart. He is a professor of medicine and the division chief for the Division of Medical Oncology at the University of Miami, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. His primary academic mission centers on early clinical drug development and oncology with a focus on upper GI cancers. Dr. Lockhart earned his medical degree at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School and did his residency in internal medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he completed his fellowship training in hematology and oncology, as well as a master's in clinical research at Duke. After completing his training at Duke, Dr. Lockhart was an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at Vanderbilt, and more recently, he served as the director of the Developmental Thera Therapeutics Program for the Sightman Cancer Center at Washington University, and Dr. Lockhart is also on our Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. So we'd like to thank Dr. Lockhart for being with us today and taking time out of his schedule. And now we're going to turn the presentation over to you, Dr. Lockhart. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Britt. Thanks for the kind introduction, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, Debbie's Dream Foundation is a lot of wonderful things, and it's located just up the street from me, so I'm, I'm happy, to be, happy to be engaged. Um, what we'll, and I'll also appreciate all the people who are um, logging into the webinar. Um, what we're going to talk about today is precision oncology and how we could potentially apply it to um, gas, the treatment of gastric cancer. Um, research in gastric cancer is one of my areas of interest, and applying precision medicine so that we can customize care for patients has been one of uh, my research objectives. Uh, next slide. So as Britt mentioned, um, gastric cancers remain a difficult problem for the patients who are diagnosed. As you can see here on this slide in 2019, the expectation is that um, about 27,500 patients will be diagnosed with this cancer, and um, the deaths associated with that are, are just over 11,000. Again, just far too many. The one good thing is that the overall incidence of gastric cancers are decreasing in the U.S. However, certain types, the more aggressive types, are increasing in incidence. Those that are located in the more proximal part of the stomach are actually increasing in incidence. When you look at the percentage of cases by stage, which is on the, the bottom left, um, a fair number of our patients are diagnosed with distant metastatic disease, about 36%. And that's, again, those patients tend to have a more difficult prognosis, as you can see in the, in the panel, the lower panel on the right, where the patients with distant metastasis of five years survival, just about 5%. But unfortunately, a lot of our patients are di diagnosed at fairly advanced where they actually have regional lymph nodes or have metastatic disease. And so we really need to do better as far as improving the outcomes with our patients. And I do think that precision medicine can potentially offer us that opportunity. Next slide. Okay, so where do we stand right now? So if you go on to the, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, which is what our um, many practitioners in the community use to, to make treatment decisions, and also this is where insurance companies make their treatment decisions, we can see that um, at least for, if we focus on the local regional disease, for the medically fit patients, they go on and have surgery, if they have an early stage cancer, 
if their cancer is a little bit more advanced, we generally advocate for perioperative chemotherapy where patients receive chemotherapy first for a couple of months, then they receive surgery, then they have chemotherapy again afterwards. And that tends to be the, the approach that we tend to use. However, if somebody is not medically fit where we don't think they can have surgery or if their tumors come back or are metastatic at diagnosis, as I mentioned about 36% of those patients at the time of diagnosis of metastatic disease, then we're looking at essentially chemotherapy as um, to try to maintain and improve quality of life and to also shrink the tumors. And um, chemotherapy is something that is effective in this particular cancer. So the list on the right is the is basically all of the approved agents that are approved for the treatment of gastric cancer. We have 5-FU, we have a three platinum chemotherapies that we use quite often, oxaliflatin, carboplatin, cisplatin. We have tax, two taxanes that we use, erinotecan, epirubicin we don't use very much nowadays um, as there are more effective agents, but every now and then you'll still see it. Trifluoridine and cipirosil was recently approved um, for these in gastric cancers. And then after that, we get into our targeted therapies and immunotherapy. So we do have some experience in gastric cancer looking at um, precision medicine as we have had success with trastuzumab. And I'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later on in one of the other slides. And ramaturumab is not really, it's a targeted therapy, but we don't really use the biomarker to help us uh, to help us to, to treat patients using that medication. So I wouldn't necessarily say it has to do with precision. And then with uh, immunotherapy, we do have biomarkers for immunotherapy. They're not perfect, but they're at least a move towards precision medicine. Next slide. Okay. Oops, one, 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 one too far. One back. Yeah. So when we talk about precision oncology, what we're, this is also known as personalized oncology or personalized medicine or individualized medicine. Some people refer to it as patient-centric. And these are some of the common terms that are used to describe um, when we're treating patients in this fashion. Um, the idea here, though, is that it is not one-size-fits-all therapy. And on the previous slide, when I was talking about the systemic chemotherapies and even the, um, even the ramaciramab, those are generally sort of one-size-fits-all approaches in that you do try to make some decisions based on, you know, how healthy a patient is and, um, you know, sometimes, you know, how much difficulty they're having eating, et cetera, about whether you can give them any oral medication. So there is some personalization that's going on, but, it's, but I wouldn't really, really call that um, precision medicine. So we're trying to get away from the one-size-fits-all approach. What we are trying to do is have, looking at specifics of the tumor and specifics of the patient, and, have, and come up with a molecularly targeted approach, something that we can use a biomarker for. What a biomarker is is when we can either draw blood or take something from the tumor that helps us decide what is the optimal therapy for this patient. And the idea here is that you can improve outcomes when we're doing more um, biomarker-driven or precision medicine-directed therapy. The example being, again, with trastuzumab, where we give trastuzumab with chemotherapy for patients who, whose tumors express the HER2 protein. And again, I'll discuss that a little, in a little bit more detail. Next slide. Okay, so with the idea here, again, following up on the last slide, is that in precision medicine, we're trying to move from informed treatment where we're basing treatment based, based on the anatomical location of the tumor as well as whether it's an adenocarcinoma or a neuroendocrine tumor. We're trying to move more towards picking therapies based on specifics related to the patient or the, or the cancer. So if you see in our, in our figure here, we have a variety, of, a variety of patients in the box on the left, and you, you might treat them all with the same therapy with treatment A. The idea, however, is that if these patients fall into different subcategories, you might treat different patients differently. And again, so that we can treat them more precisely and again, improve their outcomes, potentially have lower side effects, and again, overall have a better patient experience for them. Next slide. Okay. Right now, we are in the, we're the best we've ever been at doing this. We have a lot of technology and um, where we can do proteomics to figure out what kind of proteins are expressed in the tumors. We can do meta metabolomics, what the tumor is actually doing. Um, with, the, with its energy stores, and then genomics, what's going on with the genetics of the cancers. And more importantly than being able to collect all this data is that we have bioinformatics 
technique so that a lot of this data can be queried. Now, we all, we all have to get smarter and learn more so that we're able to apply this information, but um, we're in the best era ever in oncology where we have a portfolio of different targeted therapies and um, we have bioinformatics that can help us sort through all the data that's generated. So in order to, to, to treat patients in a precision oncology or precision medicine approach, we have to have a good understanding of tumor molecular biology and genetics. And this, this knowledge base is growing every day. Again, we have a lot of tools where we can interrogate these things. Um, we also, once you know about the tumor biology, you have to get, generate knowledge about anti-tumor targets and molecular pathways. One, the third bullet there is one I think that um, limits us to a certain degree, is that we need to have more targeted therapies. And there are, there are lots that are in development, but we don't really have um, as many as we would like just yet, especially in gastric cancer. As I mentioned, we only have about um, 10 or 12 drugs that are approved in gastric cancer and um, what we need more, especially those that are what we would consider targeted or, um, or we would consider precision medicine. It's also helpful when you're treating patients according in this way, that you understand what causes the tumor to become resistant to a particular pathway. If you can predict that, you can actually treat a patient with a combination of drugs, one drug that hits the target and the other one that hits the resistance pathway or at least you know what you're going to do next. And you, or you can design drugs up front that, have, that, have, that have get around that resistance in the first place. So that's also important information to generate. Next slide. Okay. There's not a, a talk on precision medicine that does not include this slide. Basically, it's just telling us that this is the way that cancers are generated and cancers propagate and metastasize, that they're able to evade um, a lot of the different normal processes in our body so that um, they, can act, they can activate invasion metastases, they induce um, blood vessel growth so that they can, they can get their own blood supply, um, they can avoid the destruction by the immune system. Again, these are all the different areas, the all different ways that we can potentially target tumors in general and, and gastric cancers as well, so that we can, our therapies can get better over the next few years. Next slide. Okay. So within this realm of uh, precision medicine, we have made some strides of, in gastric cancer in particular, and I'm going to highlight a few that are, on, that are on this slide. In 2010, we got the results of the TOGA trial, and I'll talk about the TOGA trial in a few slides in, and that's when patient, we found that patients that had tumors that expressed the HER2 protein, again, this is something that had been well established in breast cancer, and in gastric cancer, we caught up in about 2010 when patients express this particular protein on their tumor, then trastuzumab can be added to chemotherapy and the outcomes are improved. And that was, that was a big milestone in 2010. Soon thereafter, next generation sequencing became possible in, in a variety of tumors. And so there were, I think initially, there were, AML was the first tumor that was sequenced and then some breast cancers. And now, you know, next, next generation sequencing has become fairly commonplace. In 2014, the TCGA, um, which is the Cancer Genome Atlas, they published their data in 2014, and it subcategorized gastric cancers into four subtypes. And I'll go over that in a subsequent slide as well. And each of the subtypes has its own, has its own um, areas where we see them most commonly, which part of the stomach do we see them in? And then also, what are some of the molecular changes that we see in those particular cancers just that we can potentially um, perform precision oncology with them. Um, a subsequent study in 2015, the ACRG, which was a group of um, Asian patients, um, they also did further molecular characterization, but importantly, they also had outcomes on their patients in that not only did they have the genetic information, but they also were able to follow those patients longitudinally so they could see this particular type of molecular ch changes are associated with longer survival, better prognosis, or worse prognosis. And again, that was very important information. We'll go through that. On this slide shows immunotherapy becomes promising. It has beyond, gone beyond becomes promising. It's now part of our repertoire as far as treating patients with gastric cancer. Our hope is that in the future, you know, precision medicine will, will become very commonplace in gastric cancer and we can move forward with this. Next slide. Okay, when I talk about the Cancer Genome Atlas, 
Uh, this is one of the figures from their original paper, and I had I added the percentages in. As you can see here, there are four subtypes. There's the um, chromosome instability um, subtype, which is CIN, and you can see um, they tend to have mutations in CP53 and RAS pathway activation. RAS pathway activation is very, very, it's probably the most common um, pathway that's activated in cancers. We have the EBV, which is Epstein Barr virus. Uh, positive types of tumors, again, that represents you know, just under 10% of these cancers. Um, MSI high, which is the tumors that are hypermute, hypermutated, that have lots of mutations. They tend to respond to um, tend to respond to immunotherapy. And then we have the genomically stable. Um, those tend to, be the, tend to happen more in the distal stomach. Um, they have a lot of the alterations there have to do with what we call cell-cell interactions, how the cells actually are fused together, how cancer cells are fused together, so we tend to have alterations there. Um, but these ones, unfortunately, sometimes don't give us a lot of options as far as targeting them. But again, four major subtypes here. Next slide. As I mentioned, um, and the Asian study that gave us um, some additional information, they, they came up with four subtypes as well. They have, this, they have the microsatellite unstable type, which is very similar to the PTGA group. But then they also um, have a group of microsatellite stable that has to do with um, it has to it has to do with um, cells that are in transition, and then also we have those that are p53 mutated and p53 non mutated. And so again, they came up with four subtypes. There's a lot of overlap between the TCGA and this group as far as the subtypes concerned. But the important thing that they did in this study was that they followed patients longitudinally. So they have a better idea about prognosis, and I'll discuss that on the next slide. Next slide. So when you compare these two approach, TCGA versus ACRG, um, again you can see here that with the diffuse subtype, you have changes in um, CDH1, which again has to do with cell-cell interaction. Um, you have some that have gene hypermutation, where you have a lot of um, Again, you have a lot of mitosis, you have a lot of mutations, therefore you have all these altered proteins, so those potentially could respond to immune therapy. Um, the, in the pink color, again, back, at, back under the TCGA, um, you do see the RAS pathway that's activated. If we cut over to the ACRG group, you can see that at the, their last two lines, their last line on each of the, in each of the boxes, that they can tell you about the prognosis. Again, they followed these patients longitudinally over time, so we have a better idea of what the prognosis is. So um, in these MSF, EMT types of cancers those tend to occur in younger patients and tend to have the worst prognosis. So we really need to do some work there. And then again, you can see some of the other ones have a better prognosis or an intermediate prognosis. So again, both studies have helped to inform us about um, precision medicine and precision oncology so that we can try to make some treatment decisions based on this. Next slide. So our first attempt at some precision oncology in gastric cancer was the TOGA study. And this was a successful study. Um, this was um, presented, I want to say in ASCO 2009 and published in 2010. And basically they took just over 3,800 patients with gastric and gastroesophageal cancers and about 810, 22% of them, high, high levels of expression of HER2 protein. Again, that, that was, this is something that was well established in breast cancer. Those patients were then randomized um, to receive essentially standard chemotherapy plus trastuzumab for standard chemotherapy alone. And if you, can, if you look at the panel on the, the bottom right, there was an improvement in survival in the patients who received the trastuzumab. And this is still the best. Um, overall survival that we have seen in any uh, phase three clinical trial in gastric cancer. And so again, this remains part of our backbone of care. It's one of the first things you test when you see a new gastric cancer patient is, does their tumor express HER2 protein so that we can make a decision about whether they could get trastuzumab or not. Next slide. Okay. Now with our current efforts, these are things, this is a study that's ongoing now where there's a monoclonal antibody to Claudin 18.2, which is again involved in this cell-cell interaction and cell-cell adhesion in gastric cancer. Again, these, you see changes, molecular changes in gastric cancers in those areas very, very commonly. 
and this is an antibody that um, that's targeted into this specific clot in 18.2. Now they gave in this study, the Wilmano study or MONO study, they gave patients a variety of patients who um, with gastric cancers, they gave them the therapy. And then when they did subgroup analysis, where they're looking at those that really had, had really high expression of clot in 18.2, which comes out to be somewhere around 30% of patients, 30 to 40% of patients, they saw that the overall response rate is about 14%. Again, not, not, not tremendous, but again, something, that, something to work on. And again, this was just a monoclonal antibody alone. There was no chemotherapy in this particular study. So this was actually encouraging data that maybe giving a monoclonal antibody um, to these patients who have a high expression of this particular protein would be helpful. Next slide. That led to the FAST study, and this was presented at ASCO 2016. And what happened in this particular study was that they used the same clot in 18.2, and then patients received either chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy plus clot in 18.2. And um, in the patients that had, very, had high, very high expression of clot in 18.2, we could see that there was a difference in the progression-free survival and that um, patients were less likely to progress if they were receiving the study drug in addition to standard chemotherapy. And also patients tended to live longer if they received the study drug plus uh, chemotherapy. So again, this, is, this was further excitement about this particular agent. Um, it was, at the time, it was called I, IMAB362. And now it has a name, and that's going to be on the next slide. Okay, so now this is the, the spotlight study. So again, those other two studies um, that were earlier now led that us to the spotlight study, and now the drug is called dolbetuximab. And so we have a there's a randomized study ongoing right now. We don't have results of this yet. It's this is called the spotlight study, and it's going on internationally. And patients with newly diagnosed gastric cancers where they have not had received any prior chemotherapies are have their tumors tested for the expression of clot in 18.2. If they have high expression, like we saw in the previous studies where those patients may have some benefit from the, from the antibody, they will get standard chemotherapy um, with Folfox plus the study drug or standard chemotherapy plus placebo. And again, this is a study that's actually highlighted, I believe, on the Debbie Friedman Foundation uh, site. And so, um, again, to say that's ongoing internationally, we do happen to have that study at our facility as well. Um, next slide. Okay. That is a precision medicine study. However, there are other ways to go about studying this. Rather than just um, testing one group of patients and then randomizing, which is, which is, again, a good way to do things, there are, other, there are other ways to do this. There are basket studies and umbrella studies. So when you're looking at, um, if we think about the clot in 18.2, they think it's expressed at high levels in about 30 to 40% of patients. If you think about trastuzumab, HER2 protein level expression is about 20, around, somewhere around 20% in these patients. And so if your biomarker is a little bit more rare, where it's 5% or 8%, those kinds of things. You may have to do a different type of study. So in that kind of area, you might, some, you might consider something like a basket study where you have multiple different, um, multiple different cancer types, but you're looking at one particular mutation. So you're looking at, for example, looking at um, HER2 expression in multiple cancer types. Or you could do an umbrella study where you have one cancer type, but you have a variety of different drugs available, and you're going to use those drugs depending on what the tumors show. Um, and so this ones that fall into this category, in breast cancer, we have the I, I5 study, in lung cancer, we have the lung map study, and I will um, have a suggest, I'll have a potential proposal at the end. I don't know if we're ready to do that yet, but proposal at the end to do some sort of a, a gastric map study where you're doing an umbrella study, you're testing all the patients, and then based on what their molecular um, profile is with the cancer that we could consider treating them on a particular trial, but I'll, I'll talk about that coming um, in subsequent slides. Next slide. Okay. If we go back to our four subtypes from the TCGA, the, um, the, the genome atlas, um, as I mentioned, with each of the subtypes, there were particular molecular characteristics that were associated with those subtypes. 
And so that was very helpful information to have. Also important is that with, with, when you have these different molecular characteristics, there are drugs that are out there that um, can potentially interact with these different pathways and potentially have an impact on these different molecular on these particular molecular changes. Now, some of these have been tested in gastric cancer before and failed. Now, at the time, we didn't have biomark specific biomarkers for them, and at the time, we didn't know as much as we as we know now. And so, it would we consider going back and re-examining some of those things? It's entirely possible. Or in a um, in an umbrella study, would would we consider again looking at some of those things again? Possibly, but we also have newer drugs. Um, that have come forward since then. So again, this is something we're thinking about. If you think about something like HER2, we already have trastuzumab. We already use that. For EGFR, not in gastric cancer, and we've had failed studies in gastric cancer, tuxumab and panatumumab, but um, again, we'll be looking at the right patient. Um, CMS, again, something else that has not been successful in gastric cancer, but again, newer drugs are available, and do we, were we looking at the right biomarkers back then? For KRAS, again, which is very, very commonly altered um, there are KRAS inhibitors for there's it's for a specific mutation in KRAS, but those, those we, there are drugs available for that. For BRAS, there are drugs available for that. Um, P53 a little bit harder to target, but if you alter if you target some of the different um, pathways that interact with P53, we may be able to impact that as well. Um, PDL1 we have immunotherapy; those are approved. We already know that know that those work. Um, JAK2 again not used so much in this. In this area, more in hematology, but again, well, the, the point I'm making here is that for many of these pathways, there are drugs that are actually available that interact with that pathway, or we could target something else near that pathway or that has impact on that pathway. So um, the opportunities for precision medicine in gastric cancer are are out there, and it's something that um, I hope that we can can uh, you know move forward with in the near future. Next slide. So as I mentioned, there is a lung map study, and in the idea in the lung map study is that um, patients come in, their tumors get screened genomically, they do you know next generation sequencing, and then depending on what the molecular pathway that's identified is, they then either get randomized to the investigational targeted therapy, the sort of precision therapy versus something more standard. And at the end of these, if we if we have a study with that we're going to study say. Um, 15 different markers, it's, it's almost like having 15 different small clinical trials in there. Again, these would be much more, you know, the, uh, the incidence of these markers being altered is quite, quite a bit lower than, say, um, HER2, but you could have, it would almost come out to be a series of, you know, 10 to 15 smaller studies. But could, are we ready to do something like this in, in gastric cancer? Not certain, but it would require a large effort and a lot of um, people coming together and trying to make this decision together, but I do think that we're awfully close to trying to make something like this a reality. Um, there has been success um, with some of the arms in the I spy study in breast cancer, and again, with the lung map studies, this is something that um, has a lot of momentum at this time. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to focus a little bit about what we have going on at the University of Miami. We um, some of my collaborators, Jared Cotta, who um, noted on this slide, um, they've developed something called a patient atlas. Now, this is proprietary, so you'd have to talk to Jared about it, but the, um, for each type of cancer, if I say, Jared, I need to look up the gastric cancer patients, he can tell me, um, similar to this slide, what the racial breakdown of the patients that were seen with that kind of cancer, ages, gender, um, ethnicity, I mean, they can, he can tell me all this information and also where, where the patients um, call home so we can actually see our distribution in South Florida about where the different gastric cancer patients came from, where the different colon cancer patients came from. And so this is very powerful information to have. Next slide. And then in addition to that, um, we have, besides just having, you know, how many people are diagnosed with a particular cancer so that um, so we have that information and what their um, ethnicity and gender and the, that breakdown was. We all, it also brings in their next generation sequencing data. So if they've had, um, if we use some of the proprietary ones, say Foundation One or Caris or Garden, that information is also captured in here. 
And so not only can we find out um, how many patients gastric cancer um, had, we can say, okay, how many women with gastric cancer had an alteration in PDL1 and had overexpression of PDL1. So we're able to look at that and query that information very readily through the patient atlas. Again, it's proprietary, but um, so if a, a, somebody comes to us and says, I have a great idea for looking at a particular marker in women with gastric cancer, we can query our database and say, okay, we, we saw this many patients with this particular alteration in 2019, and we can decide whether it's, a, whether it's a study that's worthwhile doing here at the University of Miami. If you want more information, it's on the, uh, Jared's information is on the slide. You can see our precision medicine group there. Next slide. Um, just looking at my, the gastric cancer patients that we saw um, in 2018 and 2019, we had 65. And you can see here, uh, C53 alterations by far lead the pack. But there are a lot of other things that we've seen here that are potentially um, potentially addressable through a precision medicine um, approach. Some things like ATM, although that's relatively rare, you could you might consider um, immunotherapy or a PARP inhibitor in, the, in that area. And again, you can see things in the FGF pathway. So again, it looks like we are seeing a variety of molecular changes within our gastric cancer population. And so if we had a study where we want to look at FGF within our uh, patient population, I could tell you within the last year and a half, how many patients we've seen with those alterations who could potentially um, enroll in a clinical trial. Next slide. Okay, we have a monthly molecular tumor board. Um, we have oncologists, hematologists, pathologists, radiologists, people who have expertise in genetics and epigenetics who come to these meetings. And the patients are presented, they're presented uh, where they're de-identified, and the case is presented, and then also their next generation sequencing data is presented. And we, as a group, we have the experts chime in and we come up with a treatment recommendation. Hopefully there's a clinical trial that fits that patient. If we don't, um, sometimes we're able to get expanded access through some of the pharmaceutical companies to try to treat these patients with what's recommended. Um, in general, the cases are patients who have been through the usual therapies and we're sort of looking for something else for them. Um, so again, we, but there's a lot of integration with the phase one group, again, trying to come up with what, 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 what would be the best study to offer this patient. It is open to local and international community physicians that the presentations are de-identified, so there's no um, patient identifying information being presented. So um, if we, if you contact Jared Cotta, you, he can probably make arrangements for you to, to participate in this if you'd like. Next slide. So to conclude, um, the way that we take care of cancer patients is being transformed via health information technology. As I mentioned, we have bioinformatics that we have tremendous tools now so that this, all the data that's being generated from genetics and um, metabolomics and proteomics that can be that can be interrogated in, in interesting ways. We, we certainly have a lot to learn, but the tools are there where we have to start asking better questions, and I hope that we'll get better answers as well. Um, using electronic health records is a huge um, asset in that um, instead of having to comb through charts, um, it, it, it makes it a lot easier now that you can, you can certainly set up these um, computer programs that are able to query electronic health records. And since a lot of the institutions across the country share electronic health records um, because we have, you know, two or three major platforms, um, this is something that could, that studies could be looked at nationally. Um, we have a lot of platforms now that can look at genomics and transcriptomics and metabolomics. Um, and so again, these platforms are becoming more robust. Um, and we are, our portfolio of novel therapies is constantly growing. There, if you um, look at the clinicaltrials.gov website, you'll see that literally hundreds of drugs are in development and almost all of them are novel molecularly targeted therapies. Um, if, we have, if we do this correctly, you could have something like the, the, um, the gastric map study that I said we may be getting close to being able to do something along those lines, that could be an international study. Because again, you're accounting, you're not looking for a particular kind of gastric cancer patient. All, potentially all gastric cancer patients could be eligible for this because you're going to try to give them a therapy that's molecularly targeted based on their particular characteristics. 
so our clinical trials have the possibility of becoming more precise, there may be fewer patients involved. Again, as I mentioned, in something like a gastric map study, if we're able to come up with that, um, it's almost like doing 10 to 15 smaller clinical trials. These clinical trials would have fewer patients than even the TOGA trial. But again, you may get better answers from those smaller trials because, again, you're really honing in on the, the molecular changes that are essentially driving that particular cancer. Next slide. All right, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much for sharing with us today, Dr. Lockhart. Uh, we did receive a couple of uh, questions during the presentation, so I'd like to take the time to ask those questions in the remaining time that we have. Um, so the first question is, do you perform next-generation sequencing on all of your patients? The vast, the vast majority, um, especially since um, now with... Um, Recently, with some newer data, with some of these, er, where, where patients can have um, germline, so that's intrinsic to the patient, not necessarily to the tumor. Intrinsic, we have germline mutations or somatic mutations, and the somatic mutations are those that are in the tumor. Um, a lot in these DNA um, mismatch repair pathways. Those tumors can potentially be sensitive to platinum agents rather than some of the other chemotherapy agents. So more and more, I am. Um, conducting next generation sequencing on almost all the patients to try to at least give me a better idea on what I should be doing, um, even with selecting chemotherapy choices for our patients. The you know the, the standard thing what we all we look for microsatellites um, the stability or instability on every single patient. We look for HER2 expression on every single patient. We look for PDL1 expression on every single patient. But in addition to that, we're looking at next generation sequencing to see if there's anything else there that would help me to figure out which um, which type of chemotherapy might even be more effective. So we are, I would say almost all are we doing, are that we're doing that in. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, can I ask what percentage of your patients have a targetable molecular change where you can apply precision oncology? So um, when, when we think about something like trastuzumab, um, it's about 20% of the patients. Um, another 10 to 15, I think, have maybe 10 to 15 have enough PDL1 expression that it makes immunotherapy seem like it's something feasible. And so we're looking right there at about 30, 35%. So I would say probably overall, there's probably another 3 to 5% that come in that have these a little bit that are markers that are a little bit less common. So I would say probably about 40% of patients total have something that, um, that we can target with precision medicine. Now, some of the, some of them I would not put ahead of chemotherapy. There's something like when you're giving trastuzumab, I put that first. If it's something like immunotherapy, you might consider whether to do that first or second, probably second in most cases. And, um, but if it's something that's a little bit, a little bit more of a rare marker, you may want to try chemotherapy first because maybe the track record is not there to show that this is necessarily an effective strategy, but something that's worth trying. Got so overall, the answer is about 40%. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like those are all of the questions that we received. So we want to thank you again, Dr. Lockhart, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. And we hope this was helpful for you. Uh, just a couple more slides to wrap things up on our end. Of course, we want to thank our sponsors again for making this year possible. Uh, again, we had seven amazing uh, webinars, and this is the last one of the year. Um, so thank you to Genentech, Lilly Oncology, Merck, Taiho Oncology, and Estellas for really making this year possible. Possible. And just as a reminder, we have all of our upcoming events coming up uh, in 2020 starting next month. So check out our website and go out to the uh, events section of upcoming events and you'll be able to see everything there and register. And we're so happy to have Dr. Lockhart at our last one. So thank you for joining us at our uh, luncheon recently. And again, thank you everyone today for joining us. Um, so this presentation will be available uh, on our website in our lecture library. So if, if anyone you'd like to share it with, uh, I will make sure to post it today if I can. Um, and we'd also like to hear your feedback. So there are there is a survey after um, the webinar ends. So please make sure you take the survey so you can let us know how we did and uh, maybe suggest some topics for the future, anything that you'd like to see. Um, and if you have any questions, you can 
always email or call us. You can email me, uh, programs at wstream.org. And for more information, of course, visit our website at www.wstream.org. So this concludes today's presentation, and we thank you so much for tuning in and hope that you can join us next year for more webinar presentations. Have a great day and a happy holidays, everyone. Thank you.